So, hello there, Leo listeners. Carver here from Leo Listening, where I help intrepid travelers and future migrants improve their listening skills so they can connect better with native speakers. I am here with Gareth Popkins, also known as Dr. Popkins from howtogetfluent.com. So Gareth is a polyglot. Yes, he's one of these mythical creatures who speaks multiple languages. Plus, he is a native English speaker, so he gets double polyglot points. Um, he has uh, lived in multiple countries, speaks multiple languages, as I said. So he's here to talk about his experiences living abroad, learning languages, listening, of course. Gareth, anything to add? to that intro? I, I don't know, that's, uh, that's quite a build-up, Carl. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Okay, you're very welcome, very glad to hear you, to have you here. Um, right, so my first question is, are you really a doctor? Because you do call yourself Dr. Popkins. I do, I don't <laughs> believe in empty branding. Yes, I am, I'm a doctor of philosophy, however, so not the okay. who can help you if you suddenly uh, feel unwell. My background is that I studied Russian history and it was right. when I was a grad student really that I got into languages big time. And so yes, I have a, I have a, a doctorate in, in history, doctor of philosophy. Um, so that's where the doctor comes from. Okay, all right. So I assume, yeah, I assumed it wasn't medical doctor, but okay, PhD yes. uh, doctor. Okay, very cool to be able to put those um, initials uh, before your name. So I'm going to ask you probably the question that you hate, maybe hate answering as a polyglot. I don't know how you feel about it. So how many languages can you speak? Right. Well, <laughs> yes, I do hate that because I never actually call myself a polyglot. On, on how to get fluent, I uh, avoid that word like the plague because I feel it's sort of... Um, you're setting yourself up for a fall in a way by using... Okay. Because what you mean by speaking a language, speaking a language fluently, uh, varies according to who you're talking to. And of course, our ability in languages goes up and down over time. That's also normal. So I'm all mm. about realistic expectations and being honest about your achievements with language learning. So my four main languages besides my native English are Welsh, Russian and German, which I um, have. I've got C1 certificates in Russian and German. Welsh I learned to a fluent level and then I worked as a university lecturer in history in the University of Wales in Aberystwyth actually lecturing on Russia through the medium of Welsh. Wow, <laughs> wow. And my French is I would guess, though not certified, um, a, B, a good B2. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in France uh, unlike uh, Wales, Germany and Russia so I'm not so good with the slang you know. Um, and then as regards other languages, I've been working very hard over the last couple of years, uh, a bit longer now, on the Basque language, which is spoken, as you know, on the, on the border between France and Spain, or on the west, uh, uh, west end of the Pyrenees in the Basque country. So that's mm. a fascinating language. And I, have, I started learning Japanese, uh, basic Japanese, in January. And I have done tasters and studied the grammar and basic vocabulary of a number of other languages. Wow, goodness. Okay. But yeah, I see, I see what you mean about, yeah, how many do you speak? Yeah, it's a question of a level, the experience you have with it. Because some people are, yeah, some people aren't comfortable saying I'm fluent in X number because I, there's only really two where I know I'm really, really good or, or whatever. But I think, I think it counts to talk about the languages you've dabbled in, like, you know. Yes, yeah. Well, I think the thing about polyglot has been used and it's used now, it started really with, you know, some of the events which have been organized like the polyglot gathering and the polyglot conference off the back of people connecting uh, on YouTube very often and on mm. YouTube. But um, I think the key thing about polyglot is maybe, it does imply obviously literally how many languages, somebody speaks a lot of languages, but the key thing for me is that uh, I call myself a language enthusiast. Mm. Uh, uh, so the polyglots you can maybe distinguish from people who are naturally multilingual if they've grown up say in Belgium or Luxembourg or in places like India where it's common mm. to speak many languages that you've learned naturally. Uh, it's, you know, maybe the polyglot is somebody, if you're going to use that word, who's learned quite a few languages or, uh, because they enjoy doing it. Mm. Uh, the enthusiasm and, uh, uh, is the key thing for me, I think. 
Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, because I've I've never been able. I never thought I could even go to a polyglot event because I was like, well, I only really speak. You know, I consider myself bilingual in French and English, but I like, but in Spanish, it's you know, it's not the same level. I think I have a problem now because because I've might been able to get one foreign language at a very very good level. It's kind of like all the others. You feel like they don't count because they'll never be at the same level, which is a bit silly, really. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, I also felt the first uh, event I, I attended was the Polyglot Gathering in 20, I think it was 2014, the first one. And I was nervous about going because uh, my lingu linguistic background was only what I've just explained to you. And there are people far, you know, naturally more talented at languages or who've made a, an even stronger choice than I have throughout their life for languages. Right. Because it's about decisions uh, and using the... Uh, room for maneuver that we have. So I felt also rather nervous and reluctant to go to an event because of that label. Um, coming to what you said about, oh, by the way, if people are interested in those events, I've reviewed them and I've done daily vlogs from them. Uh, so you okay. can get the flavor and you can get a sense of on those, the vlogs that I do from the Polyglot Conference and the Gathering, what it's actually like uh, and how friendly everybody is. Because people are connected by an openness to new cultures, uh, at, through through the love of language, I suppose. I wanted to say something uh, about, you know, you mentioned you got to a high level in your French. Mm. Uh, and of course, one of the things that irritates those who know how much work it is to get to a really high level, and boy, do I know with my German and Russian, because mm. it's far from easy for me to get them up to the C1 level and beyond. But it's very irritating then when, you know, people claim, uh, I'm going to learn Russian from zero to 60, miles an hour, you know, as it were, from not to 60, as I always joke, by Christmas sort of thing, to see, mm. uh, because um, it, it's not realistic. So I think we've got to be careful to, to distinguish between, you know, the sort of smorgasbord of trying different languages, and that's great, and it, you know, it, it's the only field, it's the only thing it's worth knowing, as Kota Lom, the famous Hungarian linguist, said, uh, not very well, a foreign language, because just a few words, please, thank you, hello, can open doors. Mm. You have to distinguish between being at a basic level, uh, a dabbler level, and the, you know, the respect and sense of achievement due to those who really invest in, like a lot of your uh, you know, listeners and readers, getting their English or whatever language mm. you're learning to a really high level. Okay, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, there is a, yeah, there is a distinction to be, to be, to be made, uh, yes. definitely. Okay, um, so I wanted to shift gears a bit to talking about living abroad. And um, so you, you mentioned your German and your Russian. Um, I know you've lived in those countries. You've lived in, in Wales, well, Wales country, nation, one of the four nations of the United Kingdom. And you told me that you also lived in Finland and you did not learn Finnish in Finland. And you said it was okay to ask about that. So, so uh, can... <laughs> yes. What happened was, I spent, I've spent several stints in Russia, first as a doctoral student, as I mentioned earlier on, and later I actually retrained. So now I'm all, I work as an international lawyer now, I'm not a historian. Oh, wow, okay. And I worked in Moscow for four years in a, an international law firm there. So, and continued to go back and forth to Finland. But the year I spent in Finland was when I was writing up my doctorate. Uh, I was actually in, uh, studying in Oxford, but I... Uh, had had a, had a scholarship from the Finnish government because there's a great Slavonic library in the Helsinki University. Right. I was, I was pretty full on with my academic work, my history work. And of course, I'd already started to learn Finnish, uh, actually, before I went to Finland. But the reason I didn't get very far was because I think I made mistakes that, you know, I'd caution people against, that I... First of all, I was trying to learn several languages at once, uh, right. at the same level. So I was, I was learning Italian, Hungarian, and Finnish in parallel. Wow. Which, uh, and I got quite a long way at a, at a beginner's level, you know, covering all the structures and basic vocabulary in all those languages. Well, we're going back now. This is 20 years ago. So, okay. Um, uh, and uh, so I'd done some basic Finnish. But, you know, learning a language, you have to really make it some sort of priority, I think. Mm. Even if time is limited, 
And so I had more important things at that time because mm. I didn't really advance my, uh, my thesis because my grant support, the scholarship that I had was going to run out. So I had to, to work hard on writing, writing that up. I did attend classes. I did a, a semester or two of the introduction to Finnish, which was offered for foreigners at Helsinki University. Okay. But I wasn't doing enough outside class in terms of consolidating mm. and working at it to really make serious rapid progress. And that's, you know, one lesson is then really you need to focus, but also I think uh, um, you mustn't just rely on uh, classes. Mm. Unless it's a full-time intensive course, the sort that they give to diplomats or you can do on a long summer school for eight mm. weeks or if you're going to, you know, start a, a topic at university, a language at university. If you're doing the typical weekly night class or yeah. Saturday morning class, that on its own is never enough. And so that was a year when... I really did live like your classic um, sort of expat student with a lot of other uh, foreigners in Finland. I met some Finns, so I do have Finnish friends and I have continued to do bits of the language since then. It is my intention at some point to, to move it forward much more seriously because it's a wonderful, very interesting language, Finnish. And uh, I do occasionally tune into the radio and I can usually work out what they're talking about at a All basic right. Uh, but not the detail. Okay, all right. So to, to, uh, for, for another, another time when, uh, yeah, you will have maybe, yeah, more time, more focus to prioritize Finnish. Uh. Well, yes, I would like to go back and take my Finnish forward at some point, but it's all about trade-offs, isn't it? That, and this is a thing which I think, a truth, which you have to accept if you're trying to learn anything. I, I'm a truth guy in language learning, I think. And that is that something else has to give. Mm. So when I started learning Japanese, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, I'm actually I'm going to Japan in uh, October to, to go to the Polyglot Gathering, which is going to be held there. Because I'm now using my Anki flashcards on my commute to work, trying to use the downtime for the Japanese vocabulary, I'm not reading in my advanced German, which was what mm. I used to do on the tube. I'd get maybe 20, 30 minutes a day of good reading practice in because I'm doing this Japanese vocab. And so it would be the same with Finnish, wouldn't it? If I go back to that, then something else would have to, would have to give in my life. Life's about trade-offs. Um, you know, if you do more, trying to do more things in parallel, it's going to slow you down across the board. And again, that's fine. It's just about deciding what's, uh, what we uh, as individuals want to do at, e at each stage, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better my, uh, myself. Yes. All right. Okay. So I want to talk then about, well, countries where you have lived other, other than, than Finland, um, because you've lived in Germany, you've lived in Russia. Actually, you lived in... Um, Freiburg in Brisgau, is that how you say it? Uh, yeah, so that's actually the nearest German city to where we live. Um, it's just it's just two hours from 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 here. Um, so so yeah, let's let's talk about that then. So what helped you? What helped you with fitting in with the Germans and the Russians? Like, was it your language skills? Was it something else? How did you manage to kind of? Obviously, yeah. initially, yes, the language is a key thing. And with both of those languages, and this is key to my approach, I think, we've all seen expats. I mean, I was one of them in Finland who, who had spent quite a bit of time in a country. I mean, when I was in Finland, I, I found Brits who'd been there 20 years and had not learned the language. But it's important, to, I think it's very efficient if you can get the basics of the language before you go to the country. Right. Because if you arrive there, particularly if you're not a student, if you're going as an, on an Erasmus exchange or university year abroad, it's a bit of a different thing, uh, perhaps if you're majoring in the language. But if you're going to take up a job, uh, you, there's going to be a lot of practical things on your plate when you arrive. You've got to find accommodation. You've got to sort out your registration. Mm. You've got to, you know, set up a, get a phone, a phone card, set up your Wi-Fi learn how the transport system works and so on so you will find during the first few months that you and if you're starting a new job all the more unless it's one where you're going to need the language uh, you will not have as much energy being in a new place saps your energy and you will probably need to get really important things done as quickly and as efficiently as possible 
So that doesn't work so well if the language is getting in the way. Mm. So I'd say, you know, um, try and get to a B1 level. So into the intermediate, if you can, mm. before you come to the country. I wasn't that far on. I was with my Russian when I went to Russia first time for a longer period, but not with German. Oh. Um, it was very persistent that I was only going to speak in German. And I avoided the expat crowd like the plague. Uh, because also what happens in the first few days and weeks, you know, you can set, particularly if you're in a sort of very social student-y type environment, you're making friends. Mm. And, you know, it's difficult to change your social circle, to drop people just because of language <laughs> later <laughs> on. Yeah. So, so try and be careful from the start to get to know people uh, to the, and insist on speaking the language again you need to be at a certain level before that's practical mm. so i think that's really important to help you to help you integrate and it also means that you, you're not followed around by people who are just trying to uh, practice their english with you which mm. great thing if you, if you like doing that but if you're actually there if you've rearranged your life to go to a country uh, it's the same if you're an english learner coming to live in the uk or in the mm. united states don't go and hang out with your expat community, yeah, mm. English learners, because you will meet great people. There's some great adventurous, interesting people from your own language group living in the country that you've gone to. But at least while, while you, you get up and running, you want to avoid those people. Uh, and, and one great way to integrate, I think, is also to start doing things that you're interested in through the target language. Mm. So, Join a night cl class, join, uh, you know, the fan club of, you know, uh, your favorite sport, local sports team in the country. If you're into uh, a certain hobby, get involved in that uh, through the target language. And then you meet mm. Nate. You can do this online, of course, too, in That's Facebook true. groups and so on. Uh, and then you'll be discussing about the subject and the fact that you only speak broken German or uh, imperfect Italian or whatever it is will be irrelevant because the context here, it's not language learning, it's a shared enthusiasm for something else. Mm. A great way, I think, to shift the focus from, hey, I'm the learner trying to, to use you, the world, to get exposure and practice to the language, to actually a shared common interest. And of course, that's the, the root of so many great friendships anyway isn't it you know so. oh oh yeah exactly yeah well that's like that advice works on so many levels because like you know when people are trying to find a partner you see a lot of dating advice that says don't go on tinder or some app join a club join a class like you know find a shared like a community where you have a shared interest and then you're more likely to meet somebody who whose values you share who's you know who you're going to get along with you know and and maybe it will become romantic but yeah so i like that you can that also works for 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 language and it's yeah it's great instead of try, trying to talk to random people who you just kind of are bothering on this you know or trying to strike up conversations every time you go in a shop um you know ha, yeah have an activity preferably an activity that involves speaking though because some activities are like it depends what you're into some might be more or less conducive to actually using the language but yeah i love that idea i think that yeah having lived abroad for a long time i wish i had done that sooner or like kind of changed my interests in order to orient them more towards activities where you need to use a lot of language um but yeah. yeah. Another thing you can do if you've just got a short trip. So I, one of my lang one of my A sort of basic language is very basic is Portuguese. When I was on holiday for the first and only time in Portugal, I only had three weeks in the country. But uh, no, I had ten days in the country. Oh yeah. And what I did was I used Meetup.com or uh, and couch surfing to find um, groups. So there was ah. now there my Portuguese was very basic. I couldn't have a conversation. Uh, but I did meet some interesting people, and had I been staying longer, some of those might have developed into friendships where I could use my Portuguese. So that's the sort of thing you can do if you're already at the intermediate level, mm. and you've only got a week, say, in the country, then you can use those sort of meetups. Yes, they'll be more expat they'll be more international. Yeah. Build as a language exchange. But who knows, you might get in after that Portuguese uh, meet up. We went off to a restaurant, which is a really cool place, a sort of loft space in central Lisbon that I would have never found on my own. 
So even though I continued to speak English all the way through, it was a nice experience anyway. And mm. particularly as a solo traveller, as I usually am, uh, that sort of thing, uh, you know, adds an ad added uh, social dimension to the trip. and You feel a bit more like an insider. Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, what my boyfriend has started doing when we um, go on holiday, he's much more organised than me for organising trips. So what he will do is like, um, say we're going to a particular city, he will like have a look on Facebook and start looking for events in that city. So um, when we went to Turin a couple of years ago at Easter, we found this really cool like kind of food market event in the evening. And I don't think we would have known about it if he hadn't like looked at events in Turin from this date to this date. Um, Cause I don't remember seeing like posters about it or anything like, like this. And I mean, we don't really speak Italian, although Italy is one of these countries where you find that you have to very quickly start picking up some basics because people will just talk to you in, in Italian. Um, but being both being French speakers who speak some Spanish, you can kind of figure it out. Um, but yeah, no, no, I love that idea. Yeah, I love how you can make the most of short trips just by like doing a little bit of research, not just about like the touristy things that you want to go to, but also like what events are on? What can we go see? He did that as well. Then we went to Japan the same year and he found like a really cool festival in the suburbs of Tokyo, one of those... Um, Oh, festivals with the huge drums where they carry the temple over their heads and all this um, and it was amazing it was an amazing event and it was almost all Japanese people very few tourists maybe some expats who knew about it but um, yeah that's how you get the real insider information is just like acting like a local before you go so like if you live in a local place well you're going to go and have a look at what's on this weekend and you can just do the same for any destination in, in the world now um, yeah, and that's a great thing as well. You know, I was saying earlier, well, if you've, got, if you've got the opportunity to spend a longer period in a country, it's better to go, uh, you know, to when you're already at a in, uh, lower intermediate level. Mm. But from a motivational perspective, getting into the culture, uh, of course, going as soon as possible and doing that sort of thing is a great idea. And, um, you know, then you have those memories in your mind and they will help you with your motivation then as you sort of mm. ahead with the language. To come back to, you know, if you're living or staying for a longer period, I think one thing you've got to guard against as well is getting stuck on a, um, a sort of intermediate functional plateau with your language. So uh, this happened to me on my longer stints, I think, with German and Russian in a way. Right. And it was only later that I went back and did more conscious, focused work on them to get them up from a good B2 up into the C1 level. Um, because, you know, I wasn't writing very much because I didn't need that. So I was listening and speaking a lot. Okay. You get lulled into, you're using the language, say, with the local shopkeepers, as you say, and you should be doing that. You should be making the effort to go oh, yeah. to really level, strike up uh, conversations and so on. But often those sort of interactions will be quite, uh, you know, choreographed, won't they? There's quite a stereotypical type of exchange, how you're doing today, what's the weather like, or whatever, can I have three packets of X, Y, or Z? and so on, uh, dealing with taxi drivers, Uber drivers, whatever it is. So uh, that's, it. that's an, an important stage you need to get through. But if you want to keep pushing with your fluency, then you have to start talking uh, and doing other, you know, other types of activity, exposing yourself to all the four skills, reading, writing, mm. and speaking, because they all inter interact with each other as you go along. So sometimes you want to be on that plateau because we can't be full out all the time. And it happens again and again as you get more and more fluent. But sometimes you might feel, well, maybe it is time now for me to, you know, do a bit more focused study or start doing something I haven't been doing for a while. So, um, you know, do a lot more listening if you're basically someone who likes reading or if you're actually really uh, keen on speaking and listening. Maybe sometimes you should start to do a bit more writing practice, maybe work with a teacher for a period, maybe say, get focused this month to try and write one short piece of written work each week mm. and have a teacher correct it online or something like that because that will feed back then into the quality of your spoken language and it will alert you to sort of noticing to things you might have been missing missing uh, words you'll suddenly start to hear again things which have come up maybe through mistakes you've made in your written work yeah. um, or, you know it's the sort of phenomenon isn't it you, you, you hear a new concept or word in english or your native language and then suddenly you start noticing it all over the place 
that can happen with a foreign language as well as the intermediate to advanced level. Okay, I like that advice. Yeah, no, I think it's it's like um, when you want to improve. I saw this advice for like running. So if you want to get better at running, obviously you need to run a lot, but also it's good to mix up what you're doing. So like instead of going running, you might go swimming one day and that will train other parts of your body that will eventually make you better at the running part. So I guess it's the same kind of thing applied to language that if you just insist on speaking, 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 at some point it's gonna, you're just gonna get stuck. And if you actually switch gears a little, like you say, and start writing, you're speaking well. Yeah, it sounds counterintuitive, but yeah, I, I understand what you, what you mean. I actually used to write a lot more in French because I was working in a French company. Um, and then I stopped doing that. And I, I think I'm actually making more mistakes now, but completely unconsciously, because sometimes my boyfriend will, be to, will say to me like, what? Or like, in French, please. And I'm like, but I just spoke French. But I think I, think I was, uh, I think my, my, my grammar was even better when I was writing a lot because I was more conscious of it. Um, so it's interesting to see how if you neglect an area, it can actually like, it's not, it's not nothing dramatic, but I mean, it can actually slightly lower your level. Um, and I think it's, I'm a great believer in, of course, we learn by doing. And we need an mm. input. But I'm also believe in taking time aside to do some focused practice in whatever skill you're trying to develop to train it up. Mm. Um, that on its own is enough. You've got to keep doing. Uh, but because it's a way of, you know, language is a skill. And in a way, the better parallel is not learning something like history or physics, but is playing, learning a sport, play tennis mm. or some sort of craft skill. But you do need feedback occasionally listening is great here because you either understand or you don't that's one area where mm. you need help which is what well you do you know and, and how to get the listening skills developed but you know whether you understand it or not Whereas this is true writing or as you were saying with speaking we don't always know that we're making mistakes and often your friends won't tell you the people you're talking to won't tell you if they understand you as you say once you get to a certain level of fluency people aren't going to correct you because they don't want they you know they can't be bothered or they don't want to offend you or because the focus is on something else something that needs to get sorted out mm. quickly so that's when working with a teacher or a language coach can be pretty useful uh not all the time but at certain stages particularly with the active skills of reading of, of sorry writing and speaking i think to get good feedback mm. uh, you uh, tune up your um, your ability, particularly with accent, pronunciation, or common fossilized mistakes that you mm. make in spoken language, and obviously with your your writing or your writing skills. Yeah, no, that's true. But I do think even the um, so we we call them like what do we call them productive or passive skills, which I think is really unfair to reading and listening because I don't think they're passive. I think you have to interact a lot with what you're reading or listening to to understand it. But yeah, with listening, what's in, well, yes, with listening, this is the frustration. Like you either understand or you don't, or you know you're missing something, but you're not sure what. Um, and, but I think that's the added dimension of working with the teacher, because what I will do with my students is I will make them transcribe things so that I can see what they're missing. And then from that information, I take that and I explain to them why they're missing it or, you know, what the problem is. Or, you know, so I, I, I think it's you can figure it out on your own. But again, even for something passive, having a teacher helps you like kind of unlock the problem because then they can actually. Yeah give you feedback and kind of look at what, what what's really going on here and explain you know not just explain it to you but you know help you kind of break through the the sort of sound barrier i guess for 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 listening and actually like yeah help you help you understand it finally not just tell you oh that's wrong or <laughs> you know here's what you're missing but actually why um yes and you don't want a teacher of course who's inter particularly with speaking practice particularly at the low well actually the higher levels too is mm constantly interrupting you all the time mm. uh, that can be demotivating and irritating and I've had teachers like that and I prefer what I do myself is to bundle the major problem the, or the major mm. mistakes that students making and then we can discuss them at the end of you know a conversation so 
try out different teachers perhaps is good advice when you're trying to work on uh, on your speaking or, or skills in particular yeah um, the thing that you said you know you have your students transcribe I, I suppose that's what I call rather old-fashionedly dictation exercise yeah yeah and I'm a fan of those uh they're they're sort of out of fashion I think in many ways but uh, I don't know whether you agree, but I see the benefit there, and I think this is what you were saying, really, in really focusing attention, because you're really focused on what you're listening to, and then, as you say, we will flag up things that you're actually missing. Yeah, because I think this is the problem, because you can, you can just, like you say, you switch on the radio and finish. Well, I suppose, in a way, you are being active, because you're trying to tune in, at least, to the topic. Um, but then you're not, you're not sort of going into the next level of detail, which would be trying to like, oh, can I write this finish? I, I don't know how finish is sort of phonetically, if there's a good sound spelling correspondence, but like, yes. there is. Okay. Oh, great. Oh, I'm going to show off my finish now. Hoover Piva. <laughs> Hi, it's the wrong time. It's the wrong time to get in a Hoover Piva. But oh, okay. So that's, so actually you should, you should maybe try that. For, that could be fun. Um, Maybe not with like the blah, 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 continue, continuity of the radio, but maybe if there's something you can listen to that you can go back to and listen to several times, you could try playing with this sound spelling correspondence and just seeing, even if you don't know what you're writing, like try writing it out, try to guess what it means. Yeah, um, yeah and it's yeah. so useful, isn't it? If you have audio with a, trans, with a transcript, yeah. a transcript against which you can check your own dictation. Uh, is that, well, that, yeah, that is the, the, like, the like, rule number one in sort of listening, modern listening is, is make sure you do have a, have a transcript um, if, if possible or, or find a way to get one. Um, yeah, and just actually just uh, as a general thing in the, in the Dr. Popkins method, because I know there is one, is like, as we're talking about listening, like where do you stand on listening? What importance does it have for you when you're learning a new language? When do you focus on it? Um, tell yeah. me, <laughs> tell me everything. Tell us everything. First of all, I'm not sure there is a Dr. Popkins method. You've seen the series on, on how to get through. I have. Exploring and discussing whether there is one. And I went back over my language learning experience, trying to pull out, um, you know, patterns really, which might help other people. And from that exercise, I really came to the conclusion that um, what I think there are lots of different methods in, 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 lang in language teaching which work, but there are mm. principles, underlying principles, which are present, I think, generally for, uh, you know, uh, among those who are, who are successful at learning languages. And so I have my, what I would prefer to call, having done the sort of, do I have a method exercise in a series of blogs and blogs, is my sort of approach, actually, and that certainly, yes, does place um, a lot of emphasis on what I call tuning into the language. Mm. Um, yes, partly that's about the culture, what we call the pragmatics of the language, the way language is used in terms of social interactions and so on, uh, uh, whether we're direct, whether you have uh, levels of formality, other certain taboo subjects, these sort of things. Okay. It also boils down to the basic core listening skills and yes at the beginning I put a huge emphasis on listening uh, I don't mind from a very early stage listening to a lot passively and I mean really mm. passively now that's to say I've got some language on native level when I'm in the shower or something even okay. though I only really understand a few words I'm highly motivated many people would find that discouraging but then you can listen to graded sort of lower level material mm. I always, if I'm buying a language course, I always want one that has audio with it. Right. And then you can gradually, as you get to the intermediate level, if, if you were worried about feeling overwhelmed early on, you can uh, graduate to sort of native level, level stuff. But whatever you're listening to, yeah, I think you just have to do an awful lot of it. Mm. Uh, um, you know, we are not babies learning as we learned our first language. We've got what I call an adult advantage that we can bring into play. We understand about the world around us. We understand about uh, what's called meta learning, how we can become effective learners. We can take ac focused action to accelerate. Mm. But the fact is, nevertheless, a baby or a toddler spends sort of two years just listening. I'm longer, you know, in the womb and so on, they say, don't they? 
So yeah. an awful lot of listening exposure too. And this is an area, I think, one of the biggest things which uh, differentiates successful language learners from those who don't get very far is just the sheer amount of exposure and input that mm. uh, the successful learner has. And the key there, reading is great, reading is important, but language first and foremost has always been sound. Mm. And so taking that really seriously and listening a lot uh, is, is really important, I think. Now, there are some who say, don't learn necess- don't start listening. Well, this isn't a view you hear so often, but there is a view. Maybe don't start listening until you've learned um, uh, you know, the first 500 words or phrases. There is right. that view. Uh, and that might be, in a way, a more efficient one at when you're very, begin- at very much at the beginning. But I want to hear the language. You know? mm. And uh, I am fascinated by even, perhaps almost especially, when I can't understand anything at all at the beginning. Mm. Um, that's the only time you can actually hear it almost as music. I ah, remember, right, yeah. I went to Wales, and when I was learning Welsh, I was so old, it's before the internet, and before uh, Welsh was broadcast on uh, FM radio, so, or on, sorry, on, on radio anyway, you could get outside outside Wales and I came into Wales and I turned on the radio and the language sounded so bizarre and exotic but now I can't really hear Welsh to me it's just somebody talking. Mm, yeah because you, your sort of brain is translating it automatically into yeah, meaning. Once, but... once you're fluent in a language sometimes you, d- you, you, you can't hear it at all you know one of the biggest highs for me the biggest kicks was when I was in Heidelberg I was doing a, uh, sitting in on a master's Russian center so with native Russians who were doing masters in native Germans who were doing a masters in Russian language, right? And the uh, discussion in the class was switching between German and Russian. Wow. And I realised about twenty minutes in that we changed languages, and I hadn't even realised that we changed. Wow! So that sort of thing is really good, but that's you know, only to keep you going, motivate you if you were at a lower level. But at the beginning. So, you know, it, it, that's to illustrate that I couldn't, I wasn't focused on the sound. I was yeah. focused on the meaning. Yeah. And yet at the start, one of the great things is, and we should enjoy the being beginners, yeah? Mm. Enjoy each level. Just like each stage of life, it's got pros and cons, but is that, you know, you can really just hear this wall of sound. And mm. uh, in other walks of life, you know, going to a music concert or something, we pay to get that. Uh, <laughs> but with a language, you're trying to get over that. So, you know, throw yourself in, but obviously then once you start, you want to accelerate your progress, you want to be looking at graded listening material. Mm. Uh, Yeah, something a bit more strategic. Yeah, Yeah. for the, as you say, the more interactive, focused listening. Mm. But if if you're up to it, you know, uh, you know, it's not so efficient, but it's, for me, it's good for motivation and just because I enjoy it, then to have a bit of native level radio on uh, in a language, even when I'm just beginning at it, uh, doesn't do any harm at all. Of course, for many people, it would be music with lyrics, you know, that they might Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. That's how a lot of people get into a language in, in, the, in the first place. I, yeah, I enjoy doing that for, for Japanese. Like, a bit like you, I just learned a few basic things for, tra- but very, very basic for traveling. And um, yeah, so now if we watch, uh, like Japanese anime is very, very popular in France. There's a lot of uh, Japanese, French co-productions. And yeah, so some stuff, we we listen to in Japanese with the French subtitles and I just enjoy picking out the few words that I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I find it really, and that's actually an active listening task at a beginner level. Yeah. So can I hear arigato? Can I hear ohayo gozaimasu? Can I hear, you know, just these few words? Yeah. And I find it really, it sounds, <laughs> I have no plan for my Japanese or anything, but it's just, I just find that fun. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not the only person who likes doing that. Yeah, I mean, I use this thing as well with, with Basque, so, which is, as I mentioned, I'm sort of now at low intermediate, but I do, I jog, you know, for half an hour, you know, maybe three times a week, and I will have uh, now native level radio on, uh, on as I jog. Uh, earlier on, it was one of, it was the audio from one of my Basque courses, Right. But now I'm finding that, you know, I'm not making particularly rapid progress, but I'm three or four years in, but I can now follow and, and get information from native level news. Wow. That's a very different language from English, rather like, yeah. rather like Japanese. It's, so it's mm. a lot longer than it might do with a, a language which 
inches closer. Uh, but, you know, do remember, folks, as I say, there is no magic pill. And I am, I've been doing Basque on the side, not full-time intensive, for several years. And I've been listening also for several years to the radio. And gradually the mist is lifting and I'm understanding more and more. I'm not feeling particularly frustrated because my expectations about the time it takes and the trade-offs I've made in choosing not to focus on it to, uh, solely because of other things going on are really realistic expectations. And it comes back to this point that, you know, let's have, let's have the truth about language learning. It's a long-term uh, commitment, which, but, you know, that's what makes it all the more rewarding. You know, the old cliche, um, if something's worth, ha you know, if, you know, if it's easy to get, it's probably not so much worth having it. Mm. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, it brings great rewards if you're willing to invest the, right. the, the, the time. Yeah. I think that's when it brings its greatest rewards is, is when you see it through, uh, no matter what, uh, you yeah. know, yeah. uh, Okay, and just just a final point then before we kind of wrap up. Do you do you watch a lot of movies and TV shows in your target language? Uh, yeah, I do. I I do. I use the internet for that mainly YouTube. I'm not subscribed to Netflix. There's <laughs> an abundance of material out there. Although mm. I know Netflix is a great resource, uh, but I watch things in Russian and in German where I can follow a native. You know, stuff without something. yeah yeah obviously for those languages it's... I'm hooked on the shows uh, now I could take that further of course and start discussing you know I just watched an episode say of Kuchnia which is the Russian comedy of the kitchen it's about the antics in a, in a restaurant and all the stuff okay there's always a discussion underneath uh, each YouTube because it's, it's been put on YouTube officially Right. I, mean, I could get involved with commenting on that you know it's mm. something that you can do I haven't done uh, but yes, yeah, so I do. And with Basque, they also have um, a great, uh, you know, media player on about the Basque Broadcasting Company's website where you can uh, watch, catch up, use the catch up facility basically to, uh, to, to watch and listen. But again, now I'm getting, trying to get the gist mm. on at that lower level. Uh, I'm actually doing it without subtitles, uh, but obviously uh, something you will talk about a lot, I'm sure. How yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, for, so the Basque Broadcasting Service, they don't have subtitles in Basque? Well, I've never looked because uh, oh, okay. I just like to uh, try and listen. Okay, tune it. Yeah, okay. You're not so checking. I've been comfortable with not understanding quite okay. for a long time. Uh, but I can see that not everybody wants to take that approach. So, you know, I hmm. just might follow. Um, uh, you know, at a higher level, if you like, the general flow of what's going on with my uh, low intermediate or beginner's language. Okay, fair enough. It's up to, up to you. Every, you know, they're there for you to use or not use or sometimes use or, you know, there's a lot of different ways yes. um, to, to use subtitles. So there's no, there's no rule, you know, <laughs> about that. So you just have to find what's uh, cool, what's, what's right for you, I guess. All right, um, cool. Any, any final thoughts you want to share before we wrap up or? Uh, well, just, you know, keep, keep going folks. That's the key. <laughs> uh, and enjoy the journey uh, because it's all about, you know, uh, persistence over time and ex accepting that um, it will come. It's not, uh, language learning is not something uh, which requires special talent. Uh, anybody can do it if they keep going and they've got good method, they're taking good advice, and they find uh, a way into the, to some aspect of the language, connecting with people with a culture uh, to help, you know, to give you a reason to, a reason to do it. I actually think, uh, yeah, to actually bounce back to what you were saying earlier about finding like a shared interest. I also think movies and TV shows are great for that because you can learn about the culture through watching them. But also if you like join kind of all the forums, all the discussions on, on YouTube, all the discussions on Facebook, all the fan theory discussions, you can actually be part of a community in your target language talking about the, the series you're watching or the film that you've watched. So I think that, yeah that adds that extra dimension as well. 
the other thing I suppose which has been coming out of what I've been saying is that accept the trade-offs so if you're going mm. to start following this series it means you're going to have to ditch probably one of the series is or something you've been doing in your own in native language uh, because you only have so much time so you need to take conscious decisions because uh, like everything in life it comes down to priorities and taking decisions within the we've all got different amounts of you know um, room for maneuver in our lives some of us have restrictions due to our health or other commitments or where we live or so on but within the room for maneuver that we've all got we can all take a decision for our language mm. um, that's also what we need what we need to do very consciously Okay, I think that's great advice. Yeah, for adult learners who, yeah, do have to make these choices exactly. But okay, yeah, just keep going. Yeah, I agree with that. That's kind of the magic method. <laughs> if you, if that's what you're really looking for, keep going is uh, probably the 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 best advice. Okay, so where can we find you on the internet if we want well, to? Yes, uh, I'm at howtogetfluent.com. That's my website. Uh, it covers language learning in all its elements. Well, I'm focusing at the moment a bit on uh, low intermediate B1 German because I'm developing a mentored course program, which I'm going to launch soon uh, for people trying to get into the intermediate level with their German. But right. I cover all languages and methods. And I've got a YouTube channel as well, which is called Dr. Popkins, How to Get Fluent. Okay. Which do a quick tip Tuesday. Uh, I update on my own language learning projects and also I have interviews with interesting and inspiring language learners and experts. And I do a bit of travel vlogging uh, as well, often with a linguistic uh, uh, slant. And then I cover in my daily vlogs, you know, language learner, language enthusiast events too. So that's basically where you can find me. And do okay. Be great. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I'll put links for everything that. Everything you've talked about, I wrote down some interesting um, names and things to put under the video. So yeah, all the links will be under here. So you can go and find Gareth, say hello in multiple languages <laughs> if you want to, or in English, um, which would probably make more sense. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Gareth. That was great. Um, and yeah, see you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.